Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another Saturday morning meeting. I am joined today by three men who are, are very good in what they do today and what they, their uh, past. We'll start with Drake Jackson, who is the uh, a former uh, market manager for Walmart, former um, HR, yeah. was in um, category management for Sam's Club and a buyer for Walmart, and is now, you've left Walmart a couple years ago. Uh, David Carmen, who had retired as Vice President of Operations for Walmart and is now Vice President for Premium Retail. And we're joined by Tom Muccio, who was the founder and team lead for the Procter & Gamble team and since retired and moved on and doing some other things now. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad you took time out to come in and join us today. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the comparisons that we're seeing between Walmart and Amazon. Big gap between what they do. Amazon clearly seems to have the e-commerce uh, business streamlined and efficient. How does how does Walmart play catch up? And Drake, we'll start with you. Is Should Walmart just get out of e-commerce or what do they need to do to fix that? I think Walmart uh, is probably where they need to be in considering what they've invested into the, the e-commerce uh, uh, segment. Um, I don't know that it's fair to compare Walmart with Amazon.com if you look at it. I think you should compare just the Walmart.com with Amazon. Um, certainly, Walmart is focused on their core customers at, at their, their e-commerce business. Uh, they don't have the, the reach as Amazon, no assortment. So I think for what they're getting, a uh, $10 million business or whatever, $10 billion business, whatever it is, I think they're where they need to be. Um, the alternative is to, uh, you know, maybe uh, go bigger and, 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 and maybe acquire something. But uh, right now, I feel like they're where they need to be. David, you know, Walmart or Amazon's expanded into home delivery now. They're getting into the fresh grocery. Does Walmart.com, do they have a chance in competing with that? Yeah, I, um, I th I, my belief is, is that looking at Amazon and Walmart, uh, they're both in the e-commerce business and that's where it stops. Is if you look at, I mean, Walmart's a retailer, they're brick and mortar. So for the last 15 years, Walmart's invested $100 billion in brick and mortar across the U.S. So, I mean, obviously and clearly that's their, um, I mean, that's their, uh, their prime business, and e-commerce has to be a, um, a, an addition to where the customer is wanting to shop, so Walmart offers that as uh, a place for their customers to still continue to buy from them, and they do it online, and they can broaden their assortment without having the investment of the inventory in the store and, and or more brick and mortar. So it's a, it gets a complementary business to their brick and mortar stores. So I, I think that the uh, the comparison with it with Amazon, while Walmart was investing a hundred billion dollars in building stores across the U.S., Amazon was was a much more uh, narrow focus on getting a logistics system built to be able to deliver to the customers. Now, with that said, it, certainly with Amazon getting into uh, to the food business, offers a whole new uh, challenge for Walmart uh, with. Um, you know, what they do with e-commerce. And I know that they have uh, looked at that themselves. I'm sure that uh, they'll make appropriate decisions to continue to grow that business. Tom, I want to get to you on that because David's right. I mean, Walmart's invested all this money in their in their infrastructure, their bricks and mortar. But as, as times begin to change, um, more and more, particularly the millennials and the younger generation are more comfortable shopping online. Does this prove to be a problem for Walmart going forward in terms of customer retention and, and getting new customers. They just, you know, with the Superman movie that just came out, one thing that Walmart really pushed was get, come in and get your tickets early as kind of a lure to get a younger audience and younger demographic into those stores. Should Walmart be concerned about retaining those younger customers and, or having them go to Amazon? Well, you know, I think Walmart can pretty much do whatever they decide to do. Uh, you know, in the early days of Amazon, it was ex-Walmart uh, associates who actually went up and got patterned the, the Amazon system from the Walmart system, both in IT and logistics at the time. And one of the strengths that Walmart's had, I think, over the years is their ability to learn. Uh, when they bought the McLean company, they learned uh, on small assortments, they supplied snack bars, front ends. I mean, they're, they're a learning company. And uh, I think e-commerce has been a little bit of a stepchild. Uh, but I think if it becomes something that's focused, I have no question 
that they'll figure it out. I mean, with, with people like uh, Mike Duke and Rollin Ford with their logistics backgrounds, uh, you know, they, I think they could move relatively quickly. I often wondered why they didn't buy Amazon uh, early on and, and maybe the economics would still, uh, would still work today. Um, I think the Amazon, Amazon is very friendly customer experience. And I don't think Walmart e-commerce is nearly that friendly. And so I think, you know, if it is the younger folks, they're, they're wanting speed, they're wanting friendliness, uh, they don't want to do complication. And I, so I think there are some things that have to be done fundamentally uh, as building blocks. But, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule Walmart out if this is the direction they decide to go. And I also think that there's an opportunity for Walmart in places like Europe that have a high sophistication for them to go in and not have to put brick and mortar where they've had some difficulty in Germany and some other places. I think this could be a, a vehicle that's, uh, you know, could, could has some legs for them. Okay. I uh, want to move on now to the produce section. David, you coming out of operations, uh, Walmart just launched uh, the June 3rd. They announced that they're going to do 100% guarantee back on produce. As an operator, former operator, what's your take on that? Is that a good decision? Oh, no. I, I, this is not something new for Walmart. I mean, uh, the meat department years ago, we had, uh, you know, 100% guarantee. So if you didn't like the meat, you brought it back. And uh, so if you look at what's currently happening to them uh, inside their food business, they absolutely have to move. And I will I'd classify it as fresh in general. And produce being one of the cornerstones of fresh, because uh, produce and meat are your two big drivers of your fresh uh, areas of the store. So they've got to do well in those areas. And if you look at, uh, in my time there, um, historically in the early days of the Supercenter, as a percent of their food business, those fresh areas um, performed very well. Over time, that percent started to decline. So what that tells you is that, you know, uh, I, I read an article where they talking about Walmart's going after their affluent customer. Well, I don't necessarily agree totally with that statement because they are, they are not capturing, current day, they're not capturing their, the, the customer that's in their stores today shopping. They're not buying their fresh at the same ratio or a ratio that it is normal in the food business, not buying from their fresh department. So they're buying dry grocery uh, very, very well at Walmart and that business has grown. So in order for them to drive more traffic into the store, because fresh business uh, is a more frequent purchase, so it means the customers come back more frequently, and it gets the, the customer back into their into their stores, uh, and they'll buy more than just fresh. So now I think they're spot on going after that. It's an area that uh, over time has uh, deteriorated a little bit uh, for them uh, as far as image as being fresh and also capturing the customer. So getting focused on that and produce being where they target it, I mean, they're spot on for going after that particular one because that's the, the customer that uh, they need. They need to get their current customer buying fresh from them uh, at the rate that they're, uh, they should be because customers are choosing to buy fresh product elsewhere other than at Walmart. And Rick, Walmart has gone, they put people in the grower, out with the uh, produce suppliers, the people who own the fields and are doing the grow, are doing the growing. What does that mean for customers? And then what does that mean, I think, for produce industry overall? One of the things that I'd heard, it's been a couple years, but as Walmart moved to this model, and they're taking basically the first run of produce, do they wind up dumping less or inferior product into the other market that they then have to compete with when it hits other retailers? Is that who who benefits from that? Well, I, I agree with what David said. Um, when you're talking about grocery produce as a driver, without produce, you might well get out of the grocery business. You know, uh, the key word being fresh. So to answer your question, I think uh, I think the customer definitely benefits in that uh, you have a longer shelf life. Uh, if you can get in the field and deliver that good quicker and not have to transport it uh, from a country to a, to a different country or across the United States to one part of the United States, if you can drive the lead times down and the freshness up, the customer wins. Now, having said that too, uh, I think the farmer wins. The American farmer definitely wins. Uh, when they can sell big quantities uh, to a big retailer and, 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 and just face it, 
other retailers are going to copy this if they haven't already, whether it's a grocery store or a super center or some other way. So they, they are going to copy this model. It's good for that farmer, okay? Uh, it keeps them busy. It, it keeps their fields, uh, uh, you know, productive. Uh, so I think the farmer wins. I think the customer wins. Uh, as far as the, the, the supplier goes, the supplier is going to have to learn a new trick, you know. Uh, they're going to have to go into maybe sourcing other farmers. They've got to do something different. Uh, in terms of uh, what I think about, say, the mom and pop stores, well, I can tell you, mom and pop stores, they have their customers, and I believe those customers are going to stay true to them like they have in the past. Uh, when people have this conversation about Walmart and mom and pop stores, when you have a good core customer base, they're not going to leave you, you know. Uh, I think that the quality, if you look at, you know, if you look at produce, if everybody's selling great fresh produce, there's not going to be any bad produce out there. Uh, because, you know, once you get those uh, farmers established and they're growing very good uh, produce and the size, as far as the quality and the sizes and all that kind of stuff and the quantities, mom and pop will be able to buy it too, you know. Uh, I think that's just something that they have to deal with with the, with the farmer. So I think everybody wins. I think our, uh, our nation wins in terms of health, you know. Uh, and, and, of course, people are now more on this kick of eating healthy. Uh, and that's what, that's what the name of the game is in grocery right now is, is healthy. And, and you can't get much healthier than fresh uh, produce, you know. So I think it's a good win for our economy. I think it's a good win for the customer. I think it's a good win for uh, Walmart. <laughs> I think it's good, definitely good for the farmer. Okay. Tom, thoughts on that? And how? Well, I think, I think it certainly is in the right direction. I think it corrects a negative image or a, a place where they can be attacked. If you take the regional, uh, the Publix of the world, the Wegmans, the H-E Butt, they can really target the freshness uh, of, the, of their product and the localness. Uh, so I think it corrects that, uh, that negative and it then becomes a positive. Uh, I agree very much with David on the farmer winning. You know, I mean, I have a long-term contract, which I can, uh, I know exactly th that I've got a sale. Also, it's not unlike the original Made in America campaign, because if I've got that Walmart contract, I can go to a bank and borrow money against that to expand my equipment, to do other things. Uh, we, we've seen the success of, of companies like Whole Foods. Uh, and so I, th I think that this, well, well it, it will help their total and the repeat purchases and, and more store traffic. I do think it gives them a chance to get even more into organics and whatever, which are higher margin and, and there are more and more people uh, and health and wellness that they're willing to pay uh, for, for the quality. So, you know, I think it's definitely the right move and uh, I expect them to be very successful. You know, just as a side point here, Terry Leahy, who was the president of uh, Tesco, or the CEO of Tesco, at the time that he took over, one of the big ideas he had was building on, you know, as Walmart had special relationships with suppliers and had invented things like retail link and whatever to make that work. And his concept was to do that same thing with fresh. So if it was people selling them chicken, eggs, produce, and he realized that they weren't big enough in themselves to bring the sophistication. So he had to have the organization that could help bring them on board and, and make it work. Everything from logistics uh, to packaging to whatever else it, it might have been. And uh, I think that's the one thing that Walmart needs to make sure that they're investing enough in is the management to be able to, I mean, this is a, you know, going from a middleman that manages all this to now all of a sudden they're going to need to have some boots on the ground uh, making sure that this works uh, from a, a market to market. Because if you throw a party and nobody comes or you can't deliver against what you promised, you got an issue. Mm -hmm. right. Derek, I'm, uh, one thing I want to say is uh, also it's a win, it definitely a win for Walmart because uh, as, they, as the product gets closer to the market, uh, your throwaways go away. It goes down. It's fresh. I mean, and you, you can control your quantities a lot better uh, shelf if it's local. Life the shelf point. life. Is, it, it, I'll tell you, the customer wins because now, you know, you're not having to cover all these losses and throwaways, and that's money. You know, when you have to throw fresh fruit, fruit away or fresh produce away, it's money. And it, somebody's paying for it. It's, it's interesting you say that because years ago I supervised the state of Washington. I had Wenatchee, Washington, which was where, you know, a lot of apples is grown in Wenatchee, Washington. And we were shipping... Um, uh, apples out of Wenatchee down to a warehouse in Utah 
and then truck turned around and bringing them back to me. And uh, I challenged the buyer on that to say, you know, well, these Washington stores, could you not, you know, like get them delivered from the farmer and wouldn't that, and they actually dropped the, uh, you know, the cost of a case of apples went down with the growers bringing direct to the store versus the other way. Plus, you know, the freshness of the apple went up. But the other thing I'd, 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 I'd there, there are retailers out there who's bought locally right. and have good market share. And I use Myers in, out of Michigan as an example. Myers have bought local for years. It's, this is something they've done as long as Myers has been selling groceries. So and they have a really good market share in the state of Michigan and have done well. So if you take a look at Net Michigan and other retailers, there are uh, in, in, in and around the, the suburbs of Detroit, there are, there are small grocery store, uh, you know, chains of three and four stores that have done well, that fill a niche, uh, that, that provide something outside of a, a large brick and mortar super center environment. There, you know, the Kroger's there, uh, has been in Michigan for years. Uh, they seem to do well against that uh, environment as well. So this, this will improve Walmart's business, but if the local grocer or the other chains respond according to what their business is and who their customer is, they'll be just fine. And you also have some of these, some of their competitions, it's convenience, you know, I, I'm gonna, rather than fighting traffic in a super center to buy something, I may go someplace else. And then there, there are experiences. There are, almost every community has a farmer's market with local farmer, and that's, that's not only good quality, but it's an experience and, and people do that and support it. So I think it's just a net win for everybody having better availability of quality produce. Yeah. Last thought on that too, and I know we're beating this together, but I, it, the mom and pop definitely should, should win. If, if all these retailers are, are keeping these farmers busy, there's no reason for the farmer to charge mom and pop a premium because they're growing it anyway. And so really the price for that mom and pop, uh, they, Walmart and the rest of these retailers are financing uh, you know, low prices for mom and pop, if you ask me. So. Okay, very good. And then the final thing we want to talk about today is on-shelf availability. It's becoming a big deal. Store execution uh, has has always been something that Walmart and Sam's Club both have struggled with, if not every retailer. Spark is coming out, a uh, new program, and we're going to talk about that uh, later. But on-shelf availability, how does that impact Walmart, and what what do you think they do, Tom, to fix that and make sure the in-stocks are there? Well. I mean, clearly the technology that they have is very impressive, but if you've got uh, things like uh, uh, a phantom, phantom inventory or something like that, then you do have out of stocks, and that's probably the single biggest irritation to suppliers is, you know, we're, we're meeting uh, what you've asked us to do for uh, this program or that program, and the least we should be able to do is see our product uh, on the shelf and... and uh, and, and uh, replenish. So, um, I mean, there's a labor there's a labor component involved in that, and when you cut labor in a store, you're going to have increased out of stocks. And if you, a system that's highly automated and, and with, with a lot of uh, as Walmart system, if there's a glitch in the system in any way, it's going to immediately translate. Uh, it's very irritating to the consumer and it's very frustrating to the suppliers. And David. For Walmart has been kind of renowned for their ability to their distribution channels and, and taking costs out of that. Have they cut labor too much and affected that? Because now Walmart is going out and hiring third parties like Premium to come in and, and tell stores you're out of stock on something. Has Walmart forgotten how to manage supply chain? I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't go so far to say that they've forgotten how to manage uh, supply chain. I actually still believe that that's uh, one of Walmart's strengths is is their su supply chain, which I think is um, you know far and above anybody else's. Labor in store, I think that uh, there is no question uh, that uh, labor has been reduced in the stores. Uh, the, the business that I am in now currently is flourishing at Walmart and growing. Uh, suppliers are reaching out for, uh, for services uh, to get product on the shelf. Uh, I, I, I see both sides of the coin, so I won't weigh too heavy on either side. I, I think the challenge for the Walmart, the retailer is, is 
when does uh, stocking shelves and uh, suppliers having to be uh, put labor toward putting product on the shelf and setting modulars and other, uh, other activities in the store become part of your cost of goods. Uh, so then uh, is there a tripping point there to where Walmart loses its ability to uh, have a different cost structure on goods than their competitors does so then that has an impact on retails and you normalize the field. That would be the danger I would see on the Walmart side. Uh, on the other side of it, uh, there, are, there are advantages by using uh, you know, a third party labor in the stores to do specific things within your, uh, within your building that is actually more efficient uh, and can be uh, effective. Now, with Spark, which you'll cover, uh, I think, in a few, uh, yes, a few sessions. So uh, I think Spark offers some uh, opportunities to take that third party labor and make it more efficient, more effective. Um, the premium retail that I'm working for, we've been involved with Spark for uh, almost two years now. So uh, now that it's getting ready to roll out, I do see great efficiencies of improving uh, what activities uh, that the people coming into the stores are doing and making that time more effective while they're, in, while they're in, inside the stores. Um, so I see both sides of it. I think Walmart needs to really think through making sure that they don't uh, overreach and drive costs to them because the suppliers have a P and L they have to manage as well. Uh, there are publicly traded companies, uh, uh, the CPG uh, suppliers are, so they have board of directors to answer to and shareholders to answer to, and they have to deliver uh, profitability as well. So if they have cost in encroaching on them, and to make that to make that all work, uh, there, there there's danger that you know cost of goods could uh, could uh, could be increasing on Walmart side, and it not be coming through. Uh, normal channels that they've seen in the past. Drake, you were a buyer. If I come in with you to on a, on a item, I'm going to do a cost increase because I'm going to have to cover third party. What's your, what are you going to tell me? Well, I cringe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I cringe. I, I, I cringe at the fact that um, I want my suppliers to do what they do best, which is make stuff, ship stuff, so I can sell stuff. Okay. Um, when you start getting your suppliers focused on things that they don't, they're not core at, I think it's a bad thing. And it does drive their cost of business up. Um, there's no substitution for boots on the ground in the store. No substitution. You can have all the technology you want, but if you don't get it out of the back room to the floor when the customer needs it, then it's a lost cause. And that's, that's my spin on that side of it. I have a different perspective though, because um, as, a, as a senior director of a, over uh, replenishable goods, um, you know, fresh goods, whatever it is. My, my thought was always this. Um, I put more responsibility on the buyers uh, than I do the stores. Uh, buyers are professionals. You know, this is what they do. They, they buy stuff to get stuff in the stores at the right price at the right time. Suppliers and buyers, uh, I think, is a lost art in joint business planning. And I'm talking about not just what's happening today. I'm talking about a strategy around in stock and clustering stores together and finding out those stores that, that are losing volume on certain categories and why. And then- It should be an ongoing process, not a once a year. Should be an on, should be ongoing process. Some of the reasons, some of the things that you gotta look at is something may need more than, than two spaces, two facings. You know, especially if it's a, a, a hot new item. You know, that is where the, the, the buyers and suppliers gotta come together and say, you know what? We're gonna project this to do X amount of business. We gotta have five facings, that's what it takes. Do it, you know, because you're letting the customer down, you know, and you're wasting their time. And as we know now, the customers just don't have time. That both parents are working, or both partners are working, people working a lot of hours, they don't have time to go in and not find what they need, you know. So I'm a bigger proponent of buyers really working with suppliers to figure out how to get around the, the, the lack of manpower, or technology blips, that type of thing. I think a good buyer and supplier relationship can almost uh, do away with a lot of the little senseless out of stocks. Uh, when I was in merchandising, one of the biggest things I did is um, I challenged my new buyers, especially to listen to the suppliers, because they've been doing this for a while. <laughs> and when you have that, 
uh, su suppliers, like David said, they're, they're not a nonprofit business. You know, they have shareholders just like Walmart do. And so uh, my thing is, is really having a, a long-term strategy together with the supplier, a medium strategy and a short-term supplier, and a daily strategy. And as long as they, those two uh, entities are working together, they can figure out, you know, that problem. And, and suppliers don't want to be out of stock. Worse than, I think, the buyers sometimes. And so it's a matter of... Suppliers have a whole category that they're right. over, whereas yeah. suppliers yeah. got two and or so, three items in that category. Yeah, and so you, you really have to really be a partner with them. And if you're not, then you're not taking, you're not taking advantage of the expertise. Uh, and when you have them go out and, and have to go get a third party to get something on the shelf, to me, that's not smart. You know, because it, it adds cost to everybody. And yeah, you, you got to say that they can't be cost effective. If you if you move produce to get rid of a middleman, uh, and the cost is there, the companies that are doing in store service they're not for profit either. Yeah. Uh, they they've got to make money, and they're competing for talent that's reliable uh, that will show up in the stores and do what they're saying. And then they need to have a management. Uh, uh, overhead uh, cost as well as a, as a profit. So, you know, it, from I may be o way overly simplistic, but it seems to me that more labor in store taking care of that and less people checking in and, and coming out is is the, that's, the that's where I would be looking to how to fi yeah. fix that. And, and that's exactly where I'm, he said it really well. I'm, I'm, I'm for making it simple, basic, and you look at any uh, old-time supplier that's a merchant and you know, any retail that's a merchant like Mr. Sam Walton he kept it very simple you know it's very simple it's a very simple business and you start complicating it we let technology complicate it and it's supposed to make it easier you know so I, I think more boots on the ground doing what they need to do supplier and buyer relationships that are that are smart relationships uh, will cut down a lot of this this out-of-stock business well, the, the interesting thing is you go back to the, the period of time of, of uh, skew rationalization, I guess would be the, the buzzword to say, I call it less stuff on the shelf uh, that the customers wanted to buy. Uh, so well, there was two, two strategies around behind, behind skew rationalization is giving, um, you know, brand blocking in the stores to give visibility so you have strength within category of brands. Uh, but it also had a, an efficiency standpoint to it to where, you know, product that you, because you had less SKUs, less brands, uh, and the modulars holding capacity was much greater, you had more truck to shelf. So you build a, a labor model around truck to shelf because, you know, whether it's 42 load tied and now it, it had four facings and now it has 10 facings, well, truck to shelf works pretty good. You get enough on the right. shelf to last to the next truck. That that work that model works pr pretty well, and you build the labor around that. Well, now that Walmart has now put the SKUs back in, which is the right thing to do for the suppliers that listen. I mean, I'm, I'm not a SKU uh, rationalization person. I'm right, the opposite. Uh, Sam was all about you know there was three Sam strategies that Sam had: have what the customer wants when they come into your store to buy it. That's a broad assortment. Number two, have it at the best price in town. And number three, you know, give friendly service. So it was just pretty simple if it's been simplistic and straightforward. Um, but with all that said, now that the SKUs are back in the store, it does add complexity to the stocking within the store that requires um, less truck to shelf than you've had before and more handling of the product uh, a second time because it did it come in it didn't go up and it's going to have to be restocked at a later time in the day. Okay. Well, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming in and thank you for taking time to join us and we'll see you next Saturday morning.